Hello, everyone. Um, this is MJ. I'm working with Claire and Elise on corn bloom oxidation, which is a reaction that produces aldehydes, 1,2-diketones, and ketoaldehydes. It was created in uh, 1957 by a guy named Nathan and all the other people that worked for him. Um, and it's kind of interesting because a lot of times we'll just kind of like speak an aldehyde into existence when we're using it in a reaction mechanism. Um, and so it's kind of cool to see how corn bloom used to like pioneered a new way to create those. Um, it's actually known now kind of as one of the best methods of oxidation for alkyl halides, um, except it's not taught a lot in organic chemistry classes. So it's kind of like, you know, that like quiet second cousin once removed that you had that goes on to be like super, super successful. And uh, you didn't really know anything about it. Um, so anyway, the overall reaction mechanism is you've got your primary alkyl halide, and then you have a SN2 reaction with DSMO, followed by a deprotonation, and then kind of this really fun intramolecular cyclic situation that happens to produce the aldehyde. Um, so let's go over the mechanism. So we've got our primary guy there, we've got our dimethyl, DSMO, sorry, might have said that wrong. Apologies. Um, SN2 reaction, O with nucleophile attacks the electrophile. Um, the uh, X or whatever kind of halide that is leaves. Um, and then we get the R attached to the O and then the S. Um, and then we've got our nitrogen therend, our triethylamine come in. We notice that um, it's a pretty mild base. And Sacna has a pretty mild base in this case. So this is just going to nab one of these protons, and that's going to come over here um, to create a double bond. Um, so then we're going to have this, and it's set up nicely for this like super fun intermolecular reaction. I'm going to show you that in purple um, so that you can see. So this um, uh, double bond is going to go and attack the hydrogen these electrons are going to move up to produce what we'll see as the, the aldehyde, and then this is going to leave. So it's kind of a unique, interesting intermolecular conversion to produce our aldehyde. Um, and then, of course, we'll also have the loss of the dimethyl sulfide. Um, if you're doing this in lab, you've know it, you know you've done it correctly and have your aldehyde because dimethyl sulfide smells really bad. Um, and so, unfortunately for you, um, that is how you will know. Um, also, important considerations are there's a couple, there's a little bit of controversy about this mechanism. We saw a couple of different mechanisms proposed. What we presented and what I've just presented in the black is what we feel best about based on the literature we reviewed. However, we wanted to show you another possibility of a base kind of coming in and eliminating a hydrogen from here, having these electrons move up, um, and then this elimination. So this is another possible mechanism for the corn bloom aldehyde creation reaction oxidation. Um, and there you go. Um, <clears throat> also, it sometimes happens at high heat, uh, but we will talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail in a hot second. Um, other things that are important to note are that uh, this is a pretty green reaction um, because the other ways to create aldehydes include use of chromium, which is a hard metal, so it's not super easy to dispose of. Um, and so that's a plus for it. A minus is that it's maybe not the most atomically efficient uh, reaction that you've ever done. Um, but overall, it's a pretty green mechanism. And then it's also a lot, it's pretty easy to find um, the different kind of alkyl halides and the DSMO and um, the triethylamine that you're going to need. Um, there you go. The corn bloom oxidation begins with an SN2 reaction, which means that the alkyl groups are subject to the same SN2 restrictions that we've seen before. So we can use a primary alkyl group or a secondary alkyl group, but not tertiary. And if we use a secondary alkyl group, we'll want to make sure to watch out for competing elimination reactions. 
Our R group can also be a benzene or something with a ketone on it, and because these R groups improve the electrophilicity of the um, halide, we can run um, these reactions at lower temperatures when we use these R groups. There are a number of similar reactions to the chromium oxidation, and many of them really are just changing how, the, how DMSO is activated. Um, so one that we've learned about recently in the textbook is the Swern oxidation. It uses an activator called oxalyl chloride, which adds a chlorine atom instead of where the oxygen atom was. And that chlorine atom is more electron withdrawing, which improves the electrophilicity of the sulfur atom. And then when you react this molecule with alcohol, you get the alkoxysulfonium ion intermediate, which is common to all DMSO oxidations. So if you see additional DMSO oxidations, um, look out for this ion intermediate, and then you'll know those remaining steps. And the remaining steps are, as we've seen before, we use a base, usually triethylamine, but in other reactions, with a sufficiently activated um, DMSO, we can use um, the conjugate base of a weak acid. So we'll use that base to create the sulfur illid, which will then give us our ketone or aldehyde and DMS. And these last few steps are common to all DMSO oxidations. The Kornblum oxidation was actually used as sort of a jumping off point for a number of different reactions where the activator is different. And basically what's similar among all of these activators is that they are um, improving the electrophilicity of the sulfur atom. There are a few side reactions to look out for when doing a Kornblum oxidation. The first one we mentioned before, and that's looking at secondary alkyl halides and the competing elimination reaction when heated. Um, another really interesting side reaction is the Pummerer reaction. So at the top here, we'll see, starting from the alkoxysulfonium ion um, intermediate, the Kornblum oxidation proceeds through the sulfur illid um, to give us that aldehyde and dimethyl sulfide. And at the bottom, the Pummer reaction proceeds a bit differently. Um, so the illid kicks off the alkoxy ion, which then attacks that electrophilic carbon to form this sulfur oxygen acetal. The alkoxy ion attacking the um, carbocation actually looks pretty similar to a Wittig reaction. So that should look familiar. So while the Kornblum reaction is best known today for turning alkyl halides into aldehydes, um, what Kornblum actually envisioned when he wrote his paper was that um, amines would be turned into glyoxyl, glyoxalic ester, and alpha diketones. Now I have all of these molecules represented here, and they all look fairly similar, and it seems kind of interesting that you would be able to create these compounds. Um, however, what's more interesting is what you can then turn those compounds into and the use they have in nature. So all of these look very similar to and can be fairly easily converted into glyoxylic acid, which I have shown on the right. Um, and glyoxylic acid is a very common compound found in both the plant kingdom and the animal world. So in the lab, if it's exposed to water, it will form a hydrate, which we're all very familiar with. Of course, the aldehyde is where the hydrate will form rather than the carboxylic acid. We've seen these sorts of reactions before. Um, if it's just with itself in solution, it can actually form a hemiacetal with itself. And because it's six-membered and cyclic, it is very stable. And then all alone, uh, as an individual molecule, it will assume preferentially a conformation that forms a, uh, a heterocycle, specifically, um, technically sort of a four-membered heterocycle because it has two oxygen atoms and two carbons in the ring, but this heterocycle is created through H bonding uh, within the molecule itself. So these are all, all very interesting properties of glyoxylic acid, but what's most interesting is that it is found uh, in the plant and animal kingdom. And so um, the most important use of glyoxylic acid is when it is deprotonated with simple acid-based chemistry. Of course, the uh, carboxylic acid hydrogen is what is taken, uh, or the proton is what is taken, uh, to produce glyoxylate. 
And now if you look up glyoxylate, you will probably find almost nothing about the actual compound, and instead you will find a lot about the glyoxylate cycle, which seems very similar to the Krebs cycle in humans, um, but it's a cycle in plants, bacteria, and fungi that converts fatty acids into carbohydrates. And it involves some... Um, some molecules that we are very familiar with, like isocitrate and malate, and oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. So this is a very similar process by which uh, plants derive uh, their energy source and their fuel, and glyoxylate is an intermediate in that cycle. So that's just sort of in interesting all by itself and leads us into all sorts of you know, paths about plant chemistry. But then in humans, glyoxylate is extremely important, and this is because... Um, Glyoxylate is something that we synthesize in our bodies as well, but specifically we synthesize glyoxylate in mitochondrion and peroxisomes, and glyoxylate can then be turned into glycine, which is the smallest amino acid, and in many ways an extremely important amino acid um, because it can sort of fit into spaces and crevices to create kind of... Um, almost like a kind of sealant or mortar within enzymes, within proteins, uh, that in a way that no other amino acids can accomplish. It can function as both a polar and a nonpolar amino acid. People are never sure what to classify glycine as because it's our group, its side chain, is just a hydrogen molecule. Um, and if you actually look at the transformation of glyoxylate, which at physiological pH is deprotonated, to glycine, you will notice that that could easily be achieved in a lab via reductive amination. So you could create a glyoxyl or a glyoxylic ester. You could then um, convert that ester portion into a carboxylic acid, deprotonate it to glyoxylate, and then via reductive amination, you would have the amino acid glycine, one of the building blocks of life.